welcome back to the Dorm Room Sports Chat. I'm your host, Annie Marum, and we have our three analysts, Derek Fazenden, Brittany McMorris, and Zach Clark. Tonight, how the Wildcats men's basketball team did this weekend as they won their fourth straight game, a preview of Arizona baseball team, and our analysts break down the Pac-12 to tell us which basketball teams are contenders and which are just pretending. But first, let's take a look at some of this weekend's highlights. Thursday night, it was redemption for the Wildcats as the Colorado Buffs came back for round two. Carlon Brown behind the back into the basket. Buffs take a big lead, 16-11. Next possession, Nick Johnson to Jesse Perry. Doesn't quite go in. Solomon Hill is there to make sure that ball goes in the basket. Nick Johnson's about to do it again here. He finds Josiah Turner for the pretty alley-oop, and Cats hold the lead, 41-39. Josiah Turner here, you get to see him again. This time he finds Angelo Chol, who slams it in with just seven minutes to go. Cats still on the attack as Jesse Perry somehow finds the basket, gets the ball in to make it 55-48. Just two minutes to go, Kyle Fogg goes for three. It's no good, but Solomon Hill there again with the follow-up slam. Home crowd loving this play. Let's take a look at this one more time. And in the ball goes, and the Cats take this one, 71-57, redeeming themselves after that heartbreak loss by one, the last matchup between the Cats and the Buffs. On to Saturday, Brooks Reed in the crowd, witnessing an ugly first half. Sean Miller felt helpless as well. Just 11 minutes to go. Blake Wilkinson's going to bury a jumper right about now. And they take a commanding lead, 14-3. Arizona scratched their way back in as Brandon Lavender getting a rare start, and taking advantage of it. Big splash there to tie the game, 43-43. Coming back down, next possession. Why not? Let's do it again. This time, back-to-back -back trays in Arizona's first lead, 46-43. Utah would take the lead and Arizona playing catch-up. Again, but Solomon Hill throws this one down, and Arizona cuts the lead to three with nine to go. Five minutes, Jason Washburn finds a crease here, and Utah keeps the three-point lead. From there, Utah's offense disappeared. Enter Nick Johnson. Here he goes. He's going to lay down the three, and that'll seal the deal. The win over Colorado, and Utah puts Arizona Tied for third with Oregon and Colorado with a 9-4 and four in the conference record. All right, we're going to start off with some questions. Derek, first one's for you. We saw a different starting lineup against Utah with Brandon Lavender starting over Kyle Fogg for disciplinary reasons. Derek, Lavender did not start the game with a hot hand, but he sure finished with it. What do you think about Brandon Lavender starting over Kyle Fogg? Well, I think uh, it's not going to ever happen again, that's for sure. With Kyle Fogg's your leading scorer with, I think, twelve averaging 12 points, 6 points a game. But uh, Brandon Lavender, like, like you said, uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't start off very well. He's not used to starting, obviously, but uh, he finished the way he needed to, and uh, it was just enough as the Cats uh, went on to win. But remember, coming into uh, his freshman year in Arizona, he was actually ranked a better recruit than Kyle Fogg. So kind of, it's kind of cool to see how these guys have uh, progressed through the years. Yeah, I don't think there's much of a question that Brendan Lavender is much better served coming off the bench in a role-playing role than he would be in, in, in a starting position. So I, I don't think you're going to see this happen again unless, of course, Kyle Fogg decides to be 10 minutes late for shoot-around, but I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah, I don't see that happening. He's a, he's a pretty straight-laced kid. Good kid, Kyle Fogg. Good kid. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. All right, Brittany, <laughs> Utah's zone defense seemed to halt the Wildcats. But was it really that hard for the Cats to break? Or was it a matter of the Cats just not showing up to play? Honestly, I just think that they did not show up to play. They thought they had this in the bag. They thought, you know, Utah is kind of the joke of the Pac-12 basketball. And they just thought they had it in the bag. And I guess I would say Arizona is kind of a sleeper team. They start off slow, and then they kind of get it together. And I think that they just slept through the first half, honestly. Well, this has been a problem for Arizona throughout this entire season. Something that they had solved in the previous three wins. 
is a complete basketball game, 40 minutes wire to wire. They didn't get that on, on Saturday, and it almost cost them what would have been, I think, the biggest upset in, in the Pac-12 this season without a, without a question. Yeah, and you go back to the Oregon game they had a few weeks ago at home where they, they played only 20 minutes of basketball there, too. Exactly. It came out slow again. They almost suffered the same fate against Utah. And you, you just can't. They got fortunate this time, Zach, but uh, you, you can't be playing basketball like that, especially when you're – you're just this team is not as talented as they think they are. They still have some swag about them. It's good to have swagger, but you got to control it. You yeah, I mean, control it. it's good to have confidence. If you want to win games in not only the conference tournament but the NCAA tournament, 25 minutes of basketball is not going to get you there. You're going to need 40 consistent minutes, and that's something they're really going to have to work on in their next five games. And right with these upcoming games, catch up is a game that they are not going to want to play. All right, Zach. Next one's for you. Miller is using an eight-man rotation, <coughs> but with the Pac-12 tournament and possibly March Madness coming up. Who do you see as the next to be called on in order to remain fresh when it comes down to those last two minutes? Well, Andy, here's one of the problems the Wildcats have. There is nobody else. This is it. This is the Wildcats are forced into a short bench. Obviously, the one person you can look to in the future is George Mace. He should be back this week, if not next weekend. So I guess he, he'd be your only other viable option. Angelo told you to continue to play strong minutes. He's been huge on the glass and with the blocks. And then, of course, Ben and Lavender with that hot hand from downtown is going to help as well. I, I think that's it. I don't expect... There will be a Kirill Natsiad coach sighting. I don't expect Alex Jacobson to get in the game anytime soon. I think this is what you're going to see from here on out. Yeah, I think you hit it right on the head. I wish I could disagree with you, but I can't Good on luck. this one. I think, yeah. No, I think more. it's more just adding to what you said. It's more of consistent consistency. Just get the guys that are playing now, like you said, Chol, like you said with Jordan Mays, to be more consistent and then throw Lavender into the mix there too. You remember, remember when they made the Sweet 16 run back in uh, 09? They, yep. didn't, they didn't have great depth there either. They just need to have consistent play and develop team chemistry with the guys they have on the, on the court right now. The one thing they had, though, in 09 that they don't have now is two legitimate NBA players in, yeah. in uh, uh, Jordan and Chase. But, but you're right. Consistency is going to be key, and the Wildcats are really going to have to hone in on that in, in the next two and a half weeks. All right. When we come back, our analysts will discuss the Arizona Wildcats baseball team's home opener this coming weekend. I'm Derek Williams, the former U of A Wildcat. You're watching UA TV. Don't change the channel. UA TV, three e e e e e e e e. UA TV, three e e e e e. When I turn on the TV, I turn it to channel three. Cause they got all the greatest shows that I've been waiting to see. It's entertaining to me, cause it's pertaining to me. And all the other wildcats in the student body. We're broadcasting lots of all the residence halls. So all y'all's in the halls, turn your TVs on to channel three for she Z. So you can see me and all the other happy people down at UATV three. The Arizona Wildcats baseball team will open their 2012 campaign this Friday at High Corbett Field. The Wildcats are ranked as high as fifth in one in the fifth and one poll. Derek, what are your expectations for this team coming off a heartbreaking defeat in the College Station Regional Final a year ago? Uh, well, to be quite frank, my expectations are pretty pretty high. I, I think you ha you have a lot of guys returning from last year's squad. And you had this. Pretty famous junior class with Kurt Heyer, Seth Mejia Spring, Alex Mejia, and the list goes on and on. And just a very consistent group. These guys come to practice to play every day. This guy, this lineup, amazingly, will probably be even stronger than last year. Last year they finished with a 320 batting average, which was third in the nation, which is pretty dang good. And Lopez thinks they actually can be better. So I think if they can get their bullpen issue sorted out, which was the issue last year, this team definitely has a shot at a... I'll say it, national championship, absolutely. Wow. Man, all the way to the national championship. I, this, my expectations are with Derek are high as well, maybe not quite that high. And I think that they have the components to fix the problem that they had in uh, coming out of the bullpen a year ago. A, a, a little more depth and a little less injury will go a long way for the Wildcats. I couldn't agree with you more. As long as they stay healthy, I think they can get as far as to the national championship. All right, we'll see about that. We might be rolling highlights again. While the Wildcats <laughs> lost a surprising amount of ball players last spring to the MLB draft, they returned players in key positions, such as the left side of the infield and in the starting rotation. 
Brittany, how important is it to have veteran leadership to balance out some of that young, raw talent that the Wildcats have? I think it's very important. You know, these veterans have been there, and they have someone, or I guess these, like, new kids, have someone to look up to, someone to rely on, on key plays, and, you know, someone to relate to as a teammate. So I can't see what's better than that. I think one of the things that the Wildcats have that they didn't really cover in this is the guys that come back after they leave the program. Guys like Jordan Brown, Bryce Ortega, Derek can talk more about that. But they have, they have guys they can ask who that, that have not only played in college baseball, then have also made it to the next level and played Major League Baseball. So it's, it's a, a great family atmosphere the Wildcats have, and that's one of the reasons they've been so successful. Yeah, that's a perfect, that's a perfect example, Zach. And I think it all starts with Coach Andy Lopez. This guy's no been here for now 12 seasons. This guy... I haven't met a guy on the team that doesn't like this guy, and he welcomes back these uh, major league players in, with open arms. And he says you're pretty much crazy if you don't if if you don't go talk to a Bryce Ortega or a Shelly Duncan. Yeah, he always says, ask him about their hitting plan. Yeah, and That's ask him about the the, exactly, yeah. exactly. And uh, it's a perfect example. Trent Gilbert, he's going to be a freshman second baseman this year, and uh, Bryce Ortega's in town, and he's been talking to him and working out with him. And Bryce was a four year starter at second base for this Wildcat program, and I think he's probably one of the best guys you can ask. So I think. To, to answer your question, I, I think they just need to – these guys are going to mesh together. I think it's going to be similar to the 2010 squad where you have a lot of new faces. But I think it's the right amount. I think this team can do some big things. All right, Zach. Well, Arizona heads into this season with a bit more hype than the team is used to. What do the Wildcats need to have improved upon from a year ago? And what can they fall back upon from a year ago? Well, this is something we've already kind of touched upon here. One thing is they have to continue to hit the way they've hit. Now, I'm not sure a 320 batting average will be required this year with the way the staff has showed up a bit, but over 300 is going to be a must, and they must fix the problems in the bullpen. And again, I think due to injury last year, that they won't have the same problems this year. Of course, the depth has gotten that much deeper. Starting pitching will be key. They'll have to keep that fire the way it's been. So I, I think if they can focus on keeping their batting average up and keeping their ERA out of the bullpen down, this team will be just fine. Yeah, I really couldn't agree anymore with that. I, I think and just to kind of shore... Go back to the bullpen, what you were talking about. It's not so much that the closing spot was really the problem. You need a seventh, in eighth inning guy. The, the bridge, I guess, as Set Coach up. Lopez would like to say it. To get to a, a guy, which will probably be Nick Cunningham, he'll probably be doing the closing. But mm -hmm. they're going to need some guys like uh, Vincent Littleman. He's going to have to step up. And I think James Ferris. They've got, I think, Zach, you hit it right in the head. I think they have a core group where they can fix these problems. But the bullpen, you can't be blowing leads, especially when you play in a tough conference like the Pac-12. Which is, which is with no question one of the toughest conferences in all of college baseball this season. There's no yeah. doubt about that. Oh, yeah. All right, well, make sure to come out and support the Wildcats Friday, Saturday, and Sunday as Arizona hosts North Dakota State in the first ever collegiate opening day at High Corbett Field. When we come back, Zach and Scarlett McCourt discuss the baseball team's move to High Corbett in advance of opening day. The Arizona Wildcats men's baseball team hosted a meet the team event last Friday at High Corbett Field. Dorm Room Sports Chat's own Scarlett McCourt was there. Scarlett, thanks for joining me. Thank you. It's good to be here. So, Scarlett, what were your overall impressions of the event at Corbett on Friday? Well, it was definitely well organized. Um, we had a good amount of fans to show up. I mean, it could have been more, but it was pretty good. Uh, there was a Q&A session with the team. They were obviously really excited to be there, the fans and the players. Um, and they were all really stoked about the high corporate field uh, being, you know, available for them. And it was just all around just fun, good atmosphere. So how do you think that will translate in enhancing the fans' overall game day experience? I mean, they're going to sell beer. They'll have a variety of uh, food as opposed to last time the menu was kind of limited. How do you think this move is going to open it up for fans that maybe aren't your everyday baseball fan? Well, really, it's just a complete, uh, like a major league experience. You don't have to go up to Phoenix to enjoy good baseball now. You can come down to High Corbett and have a good time. Even if you're not an Arizona fan, per se, if you're just a baseball fan, you can still come and have fun and bring the kids out, bring the grandparents out, and it's just going to be a good, fun atmosphere. And you make a great point. The, this is a facility that was used for Major League Baseball for uh, 45 years. 
host of the Colorado Rockies, Chicago White Sox, uh, to name a few. So let's flip the switch here a little bit. How do you think this move will, will enhance the experience for the players? How is this going to make them put a better, uh, a, a better product out on the field? Well, they definitely have everything they need there. And you, you know? saw the facilities, correct? Right, I did. I went in and I got to see the locker rooms. I saw they have a rehabilitation room. Um, they have their... Uh, you know, their uniforms, all the supplies they need there, they have practice fields, everything they need is right there. And that is exactly what you want for a team to be successful. Everything is in one place, they can focus, all they gotta do is come out and play, and they don't have to worry about anything else. Right, this is a place that they can call home in reality. Last time when they were on campus, they were sharing locker rooms which were across the street from the baseball stadium with the men's swim team. And so now, you're in a clubhouse where it's your own, your own space, your own atmosphere, and I think that goes a long way for building team morale, and it gives the kids a little more enthusiasm maybe to play a little bit harder. Right, and that was definitely something we saw at the meet and greet, you know. They were all really excited to, to be there, to interact with people, to play. They, they're, they're excited for opening weekend, and it's, you know, a big part of it is because of High Corbett Field. And I spent some time with them on Media Day last week, and you, you, can, you can see on their faces the excitement that they are so ready to play this game coming up on Friday, their opening day. And I haven't seen such excitement for, for an opening day, whether it be college baseball or Major League Baseball, in, in a really long time. Right. And because of that, there's most likely going to be a great turnout. You know, opening day is going to be really exciting. I'm excited. So it, it's going to be fun. It's going to be the, a really good atmosphere, good crowd. And uh, that's most likely going to transfer onto the players and their success, hopefully. Well, right. And you've been, you've been to games uh, at, at the McHale Center where it's a great crowd environment. It's loud. People are excited. When you get baseball into, into college baseball, it's not like that quite so much. And I think you're going to see a much more home field advantage right. based on the move to Corbett based on more fans being in the stadium in, in the stadium I can remember times last year when the Wildcats barely got 500 fans in the seats I know this year they've already sold 500 season tickets alone so you have to imagine that their attendance will skyrocket by default based on the seasons past right and I'm pretty sure that 23 out of our 25 first games are going to be at home absolutely so they go on the road to play rice twice and, and then the rest of them are at home right so most of our crucial games are going to be here at home and that just gives us an advantage I'm sure so Scarlett what did you enjoy most about the Arizona Wildcats new home throughout your throughout your day there well I definitely um, I just definitely like the atmosphere. The minute you get into the parking lot, you see, you know, the box office, and, and it looks That big legit. Arizona Wildcats baseball sign when you first pull right. up. Right. You know, the big block A, you're, you're automatically pumped. You're automatically excited. It's a legit stadium. Um, it's big. There's lots of seats. Um, the field is huge. And it's really nice. the field is nice. in such good shape. Oh, I have, yeah. I'm not sure I've seen a baseball field that's been taken care of so well. I know they're out there rolling that field four times a day. It, it really just is the whole package. It really is. And I'm sure once the fans are in there, it's just going to be even more exciting. Remember, the Arizona Wildcats open at home February 17th. That is this Friday. Scarlett, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. When we come back, it's time for our analysts to play a little game. Stay tuned. Alright guys, it's that time again where our analysts get to have a little fun. This week we're going to play Pretender or Contender with the Pac-12 basketball teams. Each analyst gets to pick their Pretender or their Contender. Now let's take a look. Now we're going to go to Derek because he's going to give us his Pretender and Contender. All right, so for my for my contender, I'm going to go with Oregon. I think this team has been pretty consistent all, all season, all Pac-12 season long. Nothing special. They're ranked uh, the next four out right now, according to ESPN's Bracketology. But look at their schedule. At Cal, at Stanford, at Oregon State. I know that sounds tough. They've already lost Cal to Cal, so my, my pick's not looking too good there here. But I liked what I saw against Washington. And then they finish up versus Colorado and Utah. So I think they're, they're going to have a chance to make the tournament here. And my pretender, I'm going to go with Colorado. They, uh, they're 6-4 in their last 10. They've really, really fallen off since the, the beginning of conference play here. And besides at Utah next week, their schedule is pretty tough. Uh, home against Stanford, Cal, 
and then at Oregon and Oregon State. And I think actually that at Oregon game will be a pretty, pretty big game, and I don't th see them winning that. They have not been a good road team this year. So. All right, I guess I'm up. So You're my up. contender is Arizona. Obviously, we go to the U of A, so why not choose Arizona? Bear down. Well, first of all, we're on a four-game winning streak, so we're a little hot in the Pac-12, so I'm just going to go with it and... Yep. Let it out. See if it works. That's it. Out. I like it. Exactly. Hopefully, I don't jinx them. And then my pretender is Colorado. Yes, I'm from Colorado. Ouch. So and you're agreeing with me. That's even worse. I'm agreeing with you. And they've been doing really bad on the road. They're 0 and 4 on the road. So I hope I don't jinx them again. <laughs> I'm gonna do what I like to do best, and I'm gonna disagree with everybody. <laughs> Uh, my contender is Washington. I think I just jinxed all my teams. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> my contender is Washington. They are 10-3 and three in the conference, currently tied for first place. They are back-to-back -back conference tournament champions. Tony Roden is without question the best freshman in the country, 16.4 points a game. Terrence Ross, who was a sharpshooter all last season, has continued his ways this year, 15 points a game. They should look pretty good going into the conference tournament. I, you know, I'm always wary of a Lorenzo Romar coach Washington team. My pretender is Oregon. I would have loved to have picked Stanford, but they fell off too quickly. They don't even count as a pretender anymore. They never was or never will be. Uh, Oregon is 9-4. and four. As Derek pointed out, they're the last four out. I think they're going to stay that way. They have three straight road games, including the Civil War. There's not a ton of depth behind DeVoe Joseph and EJ Singler, except for Ashley. But again, I, I'm, I'm not sold on Oregon, despite their dismantling of my contender, Washington, a week ago by 20 at home. But uh, so I'm going with Washington as my 20, contender. 20-point win. That's pretty... It's it's all the, it's all, we're talking about college basketball. We, yeah. we, can, we can agree that in any conference, in any game, winning on the road is extremely difficult. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to put too much stock in a 20-point difference. Might as well have been five. You can also agree to disagree, I guess, right? We can, or all we right. could not. Fair Either way. All right, fair enough. <laughs> all right, we'll let this season play out and take a look back at what our analysts had to say. Now let's take a look at scores from around the school. The swim and dive team ends their season with a win over rival ASU making the men's team undefeated in regular season. The softball team struggled in their season opening weekend with a record of 3-3, three and three, losing to Georgia Tech, Texas A&M, and Nebraska, which featured the matchup between Kenzie Fowler and her younger sister, Nebraska's Maddie Fowler. Arizona track and field still killing it as they broke, they've broken two American records, one collegiate record, five school records, while qualifying six individuals to the NCAA Indoor Championships since the start of their season. All right, now it's time for the final word. Each of these analysts will have 30 seconds to discuss their topic of choosing. I'm going to toss it up to Derek. Your 30 seconds starts now. All right, so I'm going to go with the NBA route on this Ooh. one. Yeah, I know, Zach. That's <laughs> disappointing right there. But uh, Jeremy Lin has been ridiculous, to say the least. He's even dismantled my Lakers. I hate to admit it, but uh, i got to be fair. I'm just saying you may not want to bring Carmelo or Amari back. I don't think they're going to be welcome back because the Knicks are on fire with him. And uh, my, for my second half, I'm going to go Gilbert Arenas, come to the Lakers. I don't really care that you suck. You're a wildcat, and you have swag. So see you in a Laker uniform. Yikes. All right, Brittany, it is your turn, and your 30 seconds starts now. Okay, first off, I have to say something. A couple weeks ago, I did my ISO saying that Arizona had to come back and beat Colorado because we've lost to everything against Colorado, football and basketball, and now we finally beat them at home. Thank the Lord. And then I will continue on with a <laughs> recent story that I just did, and I'm going to let you know that Student athletics are actually doing better in the classroom since athletic director Greg Byrne put in a mandatory attendance policy. Just to let you know. Imagine Greg, what happens when you go to class. Greg, Greg Byrne's amazing? the best. Huh? You know, it's the first step to success. Class. All right. <laughs> Thank up. you, Mom. <laughs> Derek, or Zach, you're 30 seconds. Oh, Derek. Ouch. Hey, DJ. Oh, not me. That's, Ready, go. All okay, right, so anyway, <laughs> my shout-outs are going to go. I've got 30 seconds. I'm going to split up in half. First one, I'm going to keep it on the diamond. The first one, I know we've talked a lot of baseball in this episode, but i got to say, everybody needs to come out on Friday, opening day. This is one of the biggest games Arizona's going to play at home in decades. There's no question about that. And so, you know, they need all the support they can get. Second of all, I'm going to give a shout-out to the other side and ask the softball team, what's going on? <laughs> three and three this weekend. Mike Kendry has never been so overhyped on his own program, and they come out 3-3, three and three, losing three games by one run each. So I'm a little underwhelmed by the softball team's performance in the Kaijikawa Classic this weekend. Maybe you can be overwhelmed by the fireworks after the... I would love to be. I love know. being overwhelmed. Yep. I gotta I say, that was a great 30 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad. Not bad.
All right, that's going to wrap up tonight's show of the Dorm Room Sports Chat. For Zach, Derek, and Brittany, I'm Annie Marum. We'll see you next week.